Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church here in Woodbridge. Welcome to our online Bible study tonight. We are entirely online. Got uh, got a bunch of snow out there, and then after the snow was done, looks like we got a bunch of the crunchy, freezing stuff on top of it. So we are encased over here. But we did get some shoveling in, and uh, so we were able to at least safely walk into the building here tonight. But uh, the parking lot's still all covered up and everything. So good thing we have this. Uh, option here right to just from wherever you are just to tune in and join in and if you have a bible i hope you do open it up to acts chapter three we're actually going to pick up right where we left off with our sermon on sunday pick up the tail end of peter's message uh, at the beautiful gate inside the beautiful gate at the temple and uh, take it on into the first few verses of chapter four just pick up the immediate aftermath of what happened in that sermon okay so welcome so glad all of you are here got a lot of good things to talk about here in god's word tonight but first let's pray all right let's turn to the lord everybody here we go our father in heaven dear lord god thank you so much that even when the conditions outside make traveling and getting together unreasonable we're still able to meet like this Thank you that your word is still able to go forth. You just seem to be increasing, Lord God, the, the opportunities that we have to, to put your word out there for people to hear and the people of our church, even other people who may just tune in to listen. And we are so thankful for that, Lord God. We bow before you tonight. We come into your presence solely because of Jesus and only in the name of Jesus, your only begotten Son. We know, Lord Jesus, you, the Son of God, God in the flesh. You came and you gave your life for our sins. You shed your blood and died, and you rose from the dead. Hallelujah. You ascended back to the Father. You sent your Holy Spirit. You continue to give your spirit to those who believe on your name. And we rejoice, Lord God, because there isn't salvation anywhere or in anyone else. Certainly not by our own works, by our own religion, by our own perceived goodness or anything, Lord. We all fall so far short, but because of your grace and love, most holy Yahweh, most holy Lord God, there is salvation and we thank you for it. And now we can read in your word here and be reminded of kind of the beginning of the church, Lord God, and, and how you first began to preach the gospel to people. And there's just so much for our instruction and for our reminding and for our encouragement to just stir up more love for you and, and more zeal for doing your will and more worship of you. And we pray, Lord God, as we read and consider your word tonight, that you would teach us and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So, in the beginning of chapter 3 here of uh, the book of Acts, we see Peter and John, and they're on their way to the temple, as we discussed on Sunday, for the hour of prayer, one of the three daily prayer meetings the, the Jews had at the temple. And they were going to the late one, the, the one about the ninth hour of the day. And as they're about to pass through the beautiful gate to enter some of the courts of the, of the temple, uh, there is a man who they had laid there every day. And he's a man, we're told in Scripture, that couldn't walk. He was a middle-aged man, 40 years old, and, and uh, he had, from birth, had no strength at all in his legs. And so they laid him at the gate of the temple probably year after year after year. So even pilgrims for holidays and feasts recognized him from year to year and knew that that's who this was. And he would ask for alms. Peter and John pass by and you know how it goes. You know, he asks for alms and Peter gets and secures his attention, says, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I do have, I'll give to you. With the man's attention fixed on him, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he reaches out, takes him by the hand and lifts him up and immediately he's healed 
For the first time in his life, he feels strength in his ankles and his feet and his legs. And, you know, two guys came to that temple gate to go in. Three guys ended up walking in. And that fella who watched all those people walk past him day after day, year after year, now it was his turn for the first time in his life to walk through that gate. And he didn't just walk, right? He was leaping. He was praising God. And the fact that, you know, he had done this, had gone through this, you know, begging alms at the gate so often and so frequently, the scripture tells us everyone knew who it was, right? And so when the people saw it, it was like, whoa, that's him. What, what is going on here? And the Lord used this. It would be glorious enough if that was the end of the story, that this guy got healed. But the healing of this guy, as you read through it, you realize is just a means to something even more magnificent. And that is that the Lord is going to use this to gather a great crowd and is going to give Peter and John the opportunity to preach the gospel, right? To bring to people who believe strength that they never had in their souls, right? Which would lead to eternal life. Amen? And so Peter preaches the sermon. And we went through over on Sunday in the first part of chapter 3. In the first part of this sermon, Peter takes the opportunity to explain what it's going on. What are you looking at us for? He says, as if it was by us that this man received this that you see now. No, it's in the name of Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, who you crucified and handed over to Pilate and asked for Barabbas instead. That's who has made this man strong. So he preaches to them, confronting them in their sin, confronting them in the sin of having denied Jesus and even asked for someone else to be released back at the Passover when the opportunity came, right? But then you get to verse 17, a little review of this section here. I, yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. In other words, you did it in ignorance, right? Which they shouldn't have been in ignorance because they were the, the one nation in the world that were the possessors of God's word and the possessors of the things which the prophets had spoken and written, right? So when he says there, I know you did it in ignorance, it's not said to like just let them off the hook. It's said to bring conviction and, and said to rebuke them. Uh, and then he says, but God went ahead and fulfilled everything that the prophets said that he would when Christ suffered. And then verse 19 is the call to them. What? Repent. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So while he was confronting them in their sin of having denied Jesus, it was more than just that. Sins there is plural. That's very significant. Their whole life full of sin, just like you and I. Hard as we try, as good as maybe we pretend to think that we are, we are all sinful before the Lord. We've broken his laws. We've broken his commandments. And we have this storehouse of history, each one of us, an account of, of sin where we have broken God's laws. And God is perfectly good and perfectly holy and so we're stuck in our sins before the lord with no chance to justify ourselves but here comes jesus and here's peter preaching that the point of jesus suffering and dying for our sins and rising from the dead is so that if you humble yourself repent be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. In other words, repent, believe, and be converted, right? That's what brings conversion is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent, be converted, your sins will be blotted out, God will bring you times of refreshing now, his Holy Spirit will come into you, you will be reconciled to God, you will be born again, you will pass from death to life, your entire just outlook and understanding on everything, your eyes will be opened up and you will have this great just time of refreshing because you're now walking in communion with the God that you have been reconciled to, right? 
and that he may send Jesus Christ, right? So not only when someone believes are they reconciled to God, but now we fully understand and anticipate that Jesus is going to come again and he's going to reign. And we are looking forward to that. We are eagerly anticipating all of that, which refers to here that heaven must receive him until the times of the restoration of all things, which all the prophets talked about since the world began, right? So that's the call, you know? That's what he preached and called them to. Now, that brings us to, we went over all that last Sunday, that brings us to this point in verse 22. And there's just a few more words here in this sermon, but he does what is so important for every good teacher, every good preacher to do, and that is that he's not just, he's not just speaking things that he's conjuring up in his own mind. Peter is giving a very biblical message here. He has made reference already, as we have seen, to the fact that the prophets spoke of these things. And so what he's going to do here now is he's going to make reference to Moses. He's going to make reference to the prophets. He's even going to make reference to something that God said to Abraham way, way, way back, you know, in the, in the beginning of this whole epic that unfolded wherein God brought forth Jesus to bring salvation. But Peter's going to make sure that the people here understand this is the word of God that said this was going to happen. You were ignorant, but you shouldn't have been ignorant. Our scriptures foretold all of these things. This is what everybody in the world today still all these years later needs to be made aware of and needs to understand. The Bible is an active book. The Bible, is, uh, the Bible contains information that, for lack of a better way of saying it, is very much alive and at work and in play in the world. These things that Peter was preaching these are the same things we're supposed to be making, we who have faith in Christ and know the truth, we're supposed to be making people in our own lives aware of these things as we evangelize or even as we maybe invite people to come and to hear and to listen and, or give them information to read, or, or contribute to ministries that, that are pushing forth the, the word of the gospel out into the world. It's still going out. So here's what Peter does. Peter goes to the scripture and we start here in verse 22. He's still in the middle of the same message, talking to this audience at the temple inside the beautiful gate who have reacted to this amazing miracle of this fellow being healed. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Right? Now, before I go on, let's just take these all like one at a time. So the first thing that he says in this section of his message is he goes right to the scripture and he goes right to a familiar passage, and we've made reference to this in our own preaching and teaching here at church before, so this would be familiar ground if you're used to listening to me or listening to our, our church, but just so you're aware of it, this hearkens and, and actually quotes verbatim Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. The book of Deuteronomy was kind of the second uh, issuance of the law, if you will, through the hand of Moses by God. Deuteronomy was given like shortly before Moses' death. And as Moses is writing, as the Lord is directing him, Moses writes down for the people that the day was going to come that God would raise up for them a prophet like himself. But he was going to be much greater and much different than Moses because he said that uh, you, will, you shall hear him in all things, whatever he says to you. So Moses told them this mighty prophet was going to come. What is Peter doing here? Peter is connecting Jesus to that prophecy about that prophet that would come. If you remember uh, back in the prologue, not the prologue, but the early part of the narrative of the Gospel of John, um, when John the Baptist was on the scene in John chapter 1, it says, uh, now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? 
So John the Baptist is baptizing people in the wilderness, in the Jordan River, and, you know, the religious leaders from Jerusalem, they send emissaries to say, what gives? Who are you? What is this? And so they start asking him questions. So when they asked him who he was, right away he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Because that's what they're thinking initially, is like, here comes another one of these guys who's going to claim to be the Messiah. Christ means Messiah. All right. So, but, so John's aware of that. And right away, John the Baptist says, nope, I'm not the Christ. And so they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? Because there was a prophecy in Malachi that said Elijah would come first. So are you Elijah? And he said, I am not, which is an interesting answer that I don't have total time to get into tonight. But he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. In a sense, he was, but he was not literally Elijah. So he said, no. But then here's the relevant part for another day. We'll get into more of that. But here's the relevant part for tonight. They asked him, are you the prophet? Right? And when they asked him that question to John the Baptist, are you the prophet? That's what they're referring to, is what Peter is referring to in his sermon here. The, what Moses had said, that a prophet like me is going to rise up, and whatever he says to you, you're going to listen to him. Right? And whoever doesn't listen to him is going to be cut off. Right? So they ask John the Baptist, is that who you fancy yourself to be? Are you the prophet? And of course he says, no. Right? So, and then they ask him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And then he quotes the Isaiah passage famously, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He was the forerunner of Jesus. So he was not the Messiah, and he was not the prophet. But here, now, Years later, a few years later, here's Peter in this amazing time around a little after now the, 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 the day of Pentecost. Some time has progressed. And he's standing in the temple and he's boldly standing there and proclaiming this Jesus that you all turned your backs on and denied. He's the prophet. He's the one that Moses spoke of. And this is a very powerful message because in the previous message that Peter preached at the day of Pentecost itself, as recorded in chapter 2, one of the great conclusions that he reached was, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So very boldly in that sermon, Peter says, Jesus is Lord, that is a reference to his divinity. Jesus is God and uh, Christ, that is the anointed one, the Messiah. So Jesus had, uh, Peter had already boldly proclaimed in Jerusalem that Jesus was the Lord, that Jesus was the Messiah, and now here he is tying in more of the important Old Testament prophecy concerning this one all-important central figure in the plan of God to bring redemption to people. And that is, he is the prophet that Moses spoke of. Tremendous, tremendous sermon that he is preaching here, Peter, at this point. All right, so now move on to verse 34. In verse 34, uh, or verse 24, excuse me, it says, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many have spoken, have also foretold of these days, right? So first he goes back to Moses and says, Moses spoke of the prophet, that's who Jesus is. Then he goes back to the prophets, starting with Samuel. And with Samuel, you might not have a, uh, a literal, perhaps, quotation of uh, reference to Jesus like Moses had written in Deuteronomy, but Samuel was extremely significant in the whole development of God's messianic plan, right? Because it was Samuel who had anointed Saul, king of Israel, and then when Saul, because Saul was the people's choice, and then when Saul failed and was rejected by God, then Samuel was the one that God sent to who? To David. To anoint David and David becomes extremely significant not only regarded as Israel's greatest king but but and and you know the first really good king that God loved the one who had a heart after God's own heart but most significantly David was promised that someone would always sit on his throne and this ties indirectly to the Messiah 
who would be a descendant of David. And so Peter is now making the point here that all the prophets, starting even with Samuel, who anointed the ancestor of the Messiah, David, and going through all of the prophets, and as you read through all of the prophets, there's all these references to Messiah who would come. Uh, Peter is now taking all of that scripture and tying it in with the fact that that's who Jesus was. So you see, Jesus is the prophet that Moses wrote about. Jesus is the coming son of David, Messiah, that all of the prophets talked about who was going to come. Then he tells them in verse 25, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which, with God, which God made with our fathers, ready, saying to Abraham, stop there, so now he's going back even farther. You see how he's jumping all over these places in the Bible and tying Jesus to the entire Old Testament. He's the one that Moses in the law wrote about. He's the one that Samuel and all the other prophets were talking about. Now he goes back to the Abrahamic covenant all the way back. You know, we speak of Yahweh as the scripture speaks of Yahweh as being the God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel. Abraham is so foundational to, to, to everything when it comes to the, the Christian faith. It was written of Abraham that he believed God and he was accounted righteous because he believed in God. And this is the, the pattern for everyone who is saved by God's grace through faith. And ultimately, it becomes foundational for the, the great theology that the Apostle Paul would ultimately bring forth in the book of Romans, right? So what does he say about Abraham? Well, he quotes from Genesis chapter 22. So again, into the scriptures, making reference to the covenant with God, the covenant which God had made with Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And he made that covenant with Abraham, and then that covenant passed to Isaac, and then that covenant passed to Jacob, who is Israel, and that is the covenant that he made then with the nation of Israel, that in their seed, in his seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Just so you know what he's talking about here, let me just briefly read to you from Genesis chapter 22, which is what Peter is quoting from, and this is part of the, uh, the very famous story in the book of Genesis where God having promised that Abraham would have a son, even in his old age. Finally, Isaac is born, and when Isaac is grown up a little bit, you know, uh, God tells Abraham, now I want you to take him to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. And whew, boy, what a difficult test of Abraham's faith that was. But what does Abraham do? Abraham believed God. Abraham's faith in God was manifest in the fact that he obeyed God, James talks about that in his epistle. And, and he took him to Mount Moriah and got as far as actually making an altar, binding Isaac, putting him on the altar, and raising up the blade where he was going to make the sacrifice when the angel called out and stopped him, right? And then part of what uh, the angel of the Lord says in that great event is this. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven, and he says, By myself... I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice, right? What is Peter doing in quoting that passage of scripture here? He's tying Jesus in. He's saying that that blessing of all the families of the earth that God promised to Abraham, Jesus is that as well. Jesus fulfilled all of these things. In his first sermon, Jesus is God, Lord. Jesus is the Messiah, Christ. In this sermon, Jesus is the prophet that Abraham spoke about. Jesus is the son of David, Messiah, who all the prophets spoke about. Jesus is the one who would be a great blessing to all of the nations, all of the families of the earth, which God promised to Abraham way back in the day. What, what an amazing message this is. Even as I'm sitting here right now, 
saying it into this camera and trusting and hoping that people are listening and are as amazed as I am that God not only did all this, in the obscurity of the ancient world, so many years ago, nobody with phones recording anything and posting things online or anything like that, just in the obscurity of ancient times, God had all these things spoken and written and did all these things. And here we are all these years later because he has blessed us with the Bible, because he has blessed us with his spirit, because by his grace he has blessed us with the ability to look into and understand these things. Here we are able to read and understand Peter's sermon and I hope and trust be blown away and amazed and brought to a very deep reverence and fear and love and desire to worship and serve and trust in God because he's shown these things to us. We are blessed. The world goes by, man, day by day. People all around you go die by day by day. You know, we were in the way of the master class last night, which is our evangelism training class that we do here. We've been doing it for years. And one of the things that the lesson last night said to do is just stop and quiet and just think about some people you know that don't know the Lord. You do that now. Just think about some people you know that don't know the Lord. Now, if you're a Christian and you understand your Bible, think about what their fate is. And here we are, just so blessed, just so loaded up with blessing and blessing and opportunity and opportunity and knowledge upon knowledge upon knowledge, able to understand and glory and rejoice in these things. God is so good to us and we have to take the knowledge of these things to others as well. The world needs to know this. While everyone's arguing about this and arguing about that and digging and scraping and fighting about this and worried and paranoid and anxious about that, Right under our noses, here is the most important thing. From the beginning of time, God made promises and said things and wrote things and put things in motion which would point people to his salvation through faith in Jesus, his son. Here's Peter doing it, man. Here's Peter in the power of the Holy Spirit giving it out. And here's us all these years later doing it, reading it listening to it. Hopefully your heart's filled with love and gratitude and worship and faith towards God because of what he's done through Jesus. But now we need to take it and we need to spread it to other people too, right? Look what he says here. After he quotes that, he says, verse 26, to you first, when he says you there, he's referring to the Jewish people that he's speaking to. This is what Paul meant when he wrote in Romans 1.16 that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is God's power unto salvation, what? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The same gospel is for every person in the world. In your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. But those people that Peter was talking to, they had the distinct blessing of being the first people to whom it came. They were the people that God made the old covenant with. They were the people that God would raise up Messiah through. And they would be the first ones to whom this message of grace through faith unto salvation would be preached. And Peter says, you know, God made this promise to our fathers, to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And all the families, you're number one. You're first. What a blessing for them. I'm not part of the family of the earth that got it first, but I'm part of the families of the earth who got it and got the same message and got the same blessing. But this distinct honor was given to them. In you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus a reference to the resurrection that becomes important in a moment here, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities, right? God sent Jesus to bless people. In what way? By bringing them to repentance. That's repentance that he's speaking of there. It says in uh, earlier in the sermon, in verse 19, he said, repent, therefore, and be converted. Here he's describing what repentance is. 
God sent Jesus to bless you in turning every one of you away from your iniquities. It's that turning. It's that complete turn. See, the Bible says a couple things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says that godly sorrow brings repentance, which leads to salvation. And it goes on to say that earthly sorrow just leads to death. But godly sorrow brings repentance. I point that out to distinguish the two from one another. The godly sorrow over our sinfulness, the godly sorrow over the fact that our sins leave us alienated from God, that godly sorrow is actually a blessing because it leads to repentance. It is not repentance itself. Just to be sorry from your sins is not, is not repentance. But that sorrow leads to repentance. So what is repentance? Well. When John the Baptist, we made reference to him before, when he was preaching and people would come to him, he warned them to flee from the wrath to come and said to them, bring, he said, don't think that you can say to yourselves that we have Abraham as our father and all this other stuff. And he told them to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. The Gospel of Luke records this. And uh, when when uh, they asked, well, what should we do? Then he listed some things. If you stole, don't steal anymore. If you have two cloaks, give one to someone else. If you're a soldier, don't intimidate anyone and all this other stuff. So he described all these things which would be fruit of repentance, but they weren't repentance in and of themselves. You get it? So repentance is not the sorrow and repentance is not the changed conduct. It's the thing in the middle. What's the thing in the middle? It's the change. It's the turn. Literally, the word repent means to rethink, right? The, the, the English word repent is a form of the word penitence, right? They used to put a prisoner in a penitentiary so they could sit and think about what they've done. To repent means to rethink. Think it over. Think what over? Where you are before God. You're living your whole life and when you come to the knowledge of God, when you come to the preaching of the gospel, you realize what? I am not right before God. I cannot justify myself before God. And this turn takes place in you, turning away every one of you from your iniquities. And it's a, it's a divine work of God is what it is. It's not a work that man does, right? It, doesn't, it says here that God sent Jesus to bless you in turning every one of you away from your iniquities. So the call to repentance it is, is a turning and it's a divine sovereign work of God that's done inside someone, a complete change of like a coming to the end of just thinking they're okay before God and realizing that they need him. It's, it's what happens between the sorrow and the fruit of it then. It's that turn. God sent Jesus to bless people by bringing them to that, that instead of just walking devoid and ignorant of God and doing things like crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. Instead of things like that, God brought them to bring them to a change from all of that, that they might trust in Jesus and receive him and receive those times of refreshing that he talked about that come from the presence of the Lord, right? And so this is a beautiful, marvelous sermon that Peter preaches he speaks in this of Moses, talking about Jesus being the prophet from the book of Deuteronomy. He speaks of all of the prophets, starting with Samuel, writing and pointing ahead to Messiah, son of David, who had come. He speaks of the covenant made with Abraham and how the object of that covenant, the seed in whom all the families of the earth would be blessed, that's Jesus. He speaks of God blessing First, the children of Israel, and then all the people of the world by calling them to repentance and faith and salvation. Jesus is that as well. Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's what Peter was calling people to. That's what you need to respond to. And you need to have faith in Jesus, real faith in Jesus in your heart. Because that's the only way that there's any salvation for anyone. Humble yourself. Acknowledge your sinfulness before God. Turn to the Lord. Receive Jesus by faith. Cry out to him. 
Receive Jesus by believing on him and you will be saved. And then all of us together, we need to be at work doing whatever we can, even in pandemic time, whatever time it is, doing whatever we can to spread the message of this to other people. Even doing it right here online. What a blessing. You can share these videos with people. You can invite them to come and listen. Boy, you know, in the beginning, we talked about thinking about some people, you know, that don't know the Lord. Wouldn't you love those people to know the things that we're talking about tonight? Wouldn't you? Do you care? Does it matter to you? You know, or are we just content to just you know, sleepwalk our way through life? No, that can't be the way of a Christian. You could, like, invite people to this and share these things with people, you know? I don't, have, I, don't, I don't exact any benefit from that. I'm not saying anything self-serving there. I want people to hear this stuff, right? You know, that's why we're left here, to be as ambassadors and to spread this word. Well, what did it get them? I guess I will save all of chapter 4 for the next study for Sunday morning, but the Sadducees came along with the priests, the temple guards, and it says they were greatly disturbed they were preaching this resurrection bit and they end up here the real persecution begins here they end up being arrested and being put into prison and wait till you see the glory that comes out of that that'll be Sunday morning sermon all right all right let's close with a word of prayer everybody thank you most holy Lord God for this wonderful time we have together here in your word thank you for this great message that your spirit had Peter speak all these years ago and your spirit had Luke write down in the Bible here and that you have preserved and passed down to us that we may read it and be blessed and edified and encouraged by it. Anyone listening, Lord, if they need Christ, I pray that you would do that divine work of opening their understanding and bringing them to repentance and faith that they might receive Jesus and be saved right now. And for my brothers and sisters, Lord, May we rejoice and be filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, to love you and worship you. And may we desire unashamedly to share these things with others in our lives. While the period that started really with Peter and the apostles doing this and continues with us today, while that period, while that door is still open, help us to be faithful and to serve you. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, God bless you, everybody. I hope that was a good word for you. I certainly felt really good speaking it and just reminding myself of some of these things. And, ah, you know, I just, I just, I just want to see these words go out to so many people. Freely you have received, freely give. Give it out, guys. Give it out. Go call them home. Call them in. Pray for them. And use the word of God and call people in. All right? All right. Now, listen. Uh, Saturday morning is the Women's Fellowship. I believe it is online only. And I believe between Sandra and Roberta and, and uh, how they communicate with people, the word about that is all being spread and taken care of. So I think that's Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. So be ready for that, ladies. That should be a wonderful thing. Next time we will be online, Lord willing, will be Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for our service. We are open. Brothers and sisters, we are open. Come. Wear a mask. We have plenty of room to distance properly. It's, it's been very safe all this time we've been meeting. Not one person has contracted COVID here. And we've even had a couple of people come in and, and uh, they, they, they had gotten it somewhere else. And we found out later that they had it. And none of the other people that were here with them that they got it. You know, we're trying to be safe and the Lord is protecting us and just want to encourage you. Come on out. Come on out. All right. And if not, listen, no pressure about it. We will be right here and I encourage you one way or the other. Come on out or be right where you are, right in front of whatever you're looking at and listening to. And let's all assemble and join together Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. OK, everybody. All right. Love you all. Thanks for being here tonight. Stay safe, stay warm, stay dry. God bless you. Good night, everybody.